Hey everybody, Robert Adams here with the Adams Team of Rothwell Gorn Companies. Um, I wanted to check in. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope your families are all uh, safe and healthy out there. I hope some of you are starting to get back to work as we uh, start to open our city back up. I know a lot of people are getting uh, restless and uh, ready to get, get the city and economic machine back running. So uh, I wanted to check in and tell you guys uh, an update as to what we're seeing in the real estate market in regards to you know being boots on the ground agents, uh, talking to hundreds of uh, clients a day, checking in with them. We're constantly doing showings, listings, uh, writing up offers um, uh, and we're back to closing deals at a normal pace again so um, and I also want to touch on the PPP program as well as the forbearance uh, I know a ton of people are using the forbearance and you know since it came out a couple months ago they've amended the guidelines on it I, I think about six times now and what we're seeing is uh, in this last amendment was uh, there's some more clarity as to uh, how is the debt from the forbearance repaid? Uh, there's, uh, I believe, three options on that now. And as well as um, if a borrower uses a forbearance, how does that affect them getting a refinance or a new mortgage moving forward? So uh, real quick to uh, touch on the forbearance, because I know that's important to a lot of people. Um, if you do a forbearance, say it's three months or six months or whatever the term may be, uh, they are now giving three different options for repayment of that. So one, you can defer it altogether. And this is per pertaining to uh, uh, Freddie and Fannie uh, loans. So in regard to that, you can do a, a deferment, which would go all the way to the back of the loan, which would need to be paid off either through uh, a refinance uh, it would be paid at that time or if you sell the home it would be paid off at that time or at the maturity date at the end of the loan it would be repaid that's the deferment option uh there's also a payment plan that you could set up so say you did a six month uh, forbearance then on the seventh month you would have your normal monthly payment and then you would also have the additional payment to make up the debt from the forbearance so if it was six months you would take that total uh of the forbearance debt you would divide it by a 12 month year and then you would have that uh, 1 12th payment of the debt due on that seventh month also so on the seventh month you'd have your normal payment plus that 1 12th of the forbearance debt and then you would make those payments for 12 months and then after that it would go back down to just your normal payment uh, so that's the payment the uh, payment uh, program so and then the third option is the um, loan modification. So uh, in a loan modification, they basically restructure the entire uh, term, all the terms of the entire loan. And then you would make that new payment for the remainder of life of the loan or whatever terms that the loan mod spells out. Maybe it's a certain time period you make this payment and then it, it adjusts to another payment. Um, but that is negotiable between you and your lender. Um, you basically come up with a program that is going to work with your financial situation that the lender also agrees to and then that is your new loan terms moving forward um, so I know a lot of people were very concerned with you know a balloon payment after six months all of a sudden on the seventh month you're going to owe for all six months and, and things like that so that's not the case uh, thank God that that worked out for everyone uh, the second thing that I'd like to talk about is the PPP program um, this is the payroll protection uh, program for uh, employers but if you're an independent contractor you could also get this uh, even if you are just like an S Corp a pass-through uh, corporation where you're you are the employer and employee so you'd be an employee uh, an employer uh, with one employee meaning yourself um, so the way that this program works <clears throat> Uh, you can submit an application. Uh, basically, it goes off of uh, two and a half months of payroll as well as approved expenses, and it maxes out at a hundred thousand per individual person. And uh, and then you multiply that out, and then you, that's the amount that you can apply for. Once you get the funds, you have eight weeks to spend the money that they give you on the approved expenses. And as long as you do that, then you can submit an application for forgiveness, and you show the um, the approved expenses and receipts or statements uh, proving that you had paid uh, the approved list and then they will forgive uh, the loan amount, meaning you do not need to pay it back. This makes this program extremely attractive because now they're basically giving you free money as long as you spend it on what you're supposed to. Um, the 
the other part of it is the uh, PPP program was originally funded. It was around a $350 billion. Uh, it ran out in a matter of weeks. Um, they did a second round of funding. Um, that, those funds are still available at this point. Um, from what I've heard, the SBA uh, is backed up and overwhelmed as far as funding. So they're accepting applications, they're approving the applications, but then it's supposed to only take a couple of days for people to get the money. But um, I've heard stories of it, it being like a week and a half, almost two weeks later, and people still don't have their funds. Um, but technically at this point, there is still funds available. They're just overwhelmed with applications as far as getting it to everybody. So uh, if you do not have an application turned in yet, I would be hot on it and get that thing turned in ASAP. Hopefully you can get the funds before they run out. Um, from what I've heard, they are not going to do a third round of funding for this program. So, uh, you know, that could always change because things are changing day by day. But I would encourage you to get your uh, uh, application in sooner rather than later on that. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about is really the pulse of the market and what my team and I are uh, feeling as boots on the ground agents here. And, you know, early on uh, with the virus, there were, you know, if you had deals in escrow and then all of a sudden the virus came, there were a ton of cancellations because people were panicking, um, even if they weren't directly impacted. Say, you know, obviously if you're, if you're directly impacted, you uh, had a decrease in income, you can't get the loan anymore, or say you uh, lost your job altogether, you had to shut down your business or whatever the case may be, you're unable to get financing, obviously those deals uh, died. Um, even if you were still able to get the loan and purchase a home, there were still a lot of cancellations there because of just pure uncertainty. You know, people didn't know if the sky is falling. Is this the end of the world? You know, what, how bad is this going to get? Our home value is going to, you know, drop 50 percent. Nobody knew what was going to happen. So it was a huge question mark. So we saw a ton of cancellations. Um, you know, in, in the first quarter of 2020, we closed uh, 29 transactions, you know, just under 10 a month. Uh, to put that in perspective, in April, we only closed two deals, which was crazy for us. I mean, I can't even remember the last month where we only closed two deals. So, um, but I feel like since then, uh, a lot of those types of panic cancellations have really worked themselves out of the system. And now anybody that's going into escrow at this point, there was a virus, you went into escrow, there's still a virus. There, it's not this giant surprise once you're already in the middle of the deal. So I attribute a lot of the decrease in cancellations to that. Um, we do still see cancellations from time to time um, because, you know, layoffs or businesses closing or decrease in income. Those types of things are still happening. But uh, so if somebody goes into escrow, they're, they're OK. They know the virus is there. They're OK with it. They, st you know, they still have confidence in the market. They still want to purchase. We go into escrow. Now that we're in escrow, um, you know, most of the people, if as long as their finances stay solid, they're still closing those deals. It's pretty rare that we're seeing any cancellations just because of somebody panicking. Um, however, it, you know, the ripple effects of businesses closing or uh, decrease in income and that, those types of things um, are still happening sometimes, not as often as earlier, uh, maybe a month, month and a half ago. Um, but we are still seeing a few cancellations here and there because they just can't get financing at the end of the deal. So, you know, ca cash is king again. Uh, if you have a, a, a finance buyer or a cash buyer, uh, we're seeing sellers that will even take a little bit less money and go with a cash buyer so that they don't have to worry about the deal falling out because all of a sudden somebody lost a job and they can't get a loan. So, um, but to go back to the volume that we're seeing, uh, like I said, in April, we only closed two deals, which was insane for us. And uh, this, we've already seen an uptick. So this month, um, uh, we're starting to get towards the end of the month here. We still have, uh, you know, a week and a half or so, but uh, we've already closed six deals. So we've already tripled what we did last uh, month. And then we have another nine deals set to close before the end of the month. So if, if everything... Um, uh, stay, stay solid and we, we get to the closing table, um, we should have 15 closings by the end of this month. So it just goes to show you the first three months we had 29. So say uh, nine deals in January, uh, 10 in February, 10 in um, March, April drops down to two. And now here, are, here we are in May and we're set, set to close 15. So um, I, I feel like we're rebounding and May is going as far as our numbers, and I'm hoping this is what other teams and agents are experiencing as well, is that um, 
uh, May is going to help offset some of those uh, that slump that we saw in April. So, you know, I have a lot of clients that reach out to me and they ask me, you know, what, what do you think about the market? Do you think that it's going to crash? Do you think that it's going to keep going strong? And, you know, I tell people there's enough information out there that if you're trying to build a case either way, you know, you want to quote certain people, you want to quote articles, you want to look for data and statistics. I can build a case and I can have references that will show why the market is going to stay strong and fuel a recovery through the uh, through this whole crisis. Or if I'm doom and gloom and I think the sky is falling, there's enough data out there that I can go ahead and uh, cite references and build a case and, and convince you that the, the, the market's going to fall. And the reason that you know I, I say that is because we're in uncharted territory right now. This has never happened before. No one knows exactly what's going to happen. So anybody that's out there telling you this is 100% what's going to happen – is not giving you good advice, in my opinion. No one has a crystal ball. No one knows how how this is going to all play out. Um, all we can go off of is the data that we have to work with, right? Supply and demand. Supply is real easy, the inventory. Where were we at in inventory before the virus? We were at an extreme low. We were below two months supply here in Las Vegas, which is crazy. That means, I mean, there was a double, a dozen offers on every property, you know? Uh, we were getting outbid. I, in one week, we had three bidding wars that we lost, where it was, um, you know, we, we, we were aware that the home had multiple offers. Um, we were aware that uh, it was in high demand, even without the multiple offers, just because of the condition of the home, the price and all of that. So we knew that we had to go in aggressive. So we had buyers that loved the house. This is the one I want it. I don't want to lose it. They went in $15,000 above what we thought the home would appraise at. And we lost that bidding war. The sellers didn't even give us an opportunity to counter, come in with a stronger offer. They straight rejected it and went with another offer. That happened on two different properties, $15,000 above what we thought it would appraise at. Um, and then we had a third one that we went $11,000 above what we thought it would appraise at. And again, not even a counter. They rejected it and straight went with another offer. So um, that gives you a sense of how strong of a seller's market that we were in before the virus. And in my opinion, due to that low inventory and the high, high demand, we were set to have one of the strongest spring markets that we've ever had. And um, and then the then the virus hit, and now we have seen inventory go up. We're we're in we kind of we're fluctuating in between that uh, three and three and a half month supply now. So it has gone up, but to be in a balanced market where you're not in a seller's market, you're not in a buyer's market, you need to be. Uh, that's around four to six months supply. If you go over six months supply, you're in a buyer's market. Uh, buyers are in the driver's seat. They're going to start lowballing. Desperate sellers are going to take that lowball. Now when the next guy comes to sell, his last comp is this low ball offer and that's when you start to see a trickle down effect uh and a decrease in in pricing um i think we're a, a ways off from there i mean we would almost almost have to double our inventory to go into a buyer's market at this point so i and i think it's gradual we're not seeing these giant spikes in um inventory levels so it's it really is a gradual increase and we have seen it start to taper off a little bit already so i really don't predict that it's going to go there. Um, but again, nobody has a crystal ball. I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but that's the feeling that we're getting. Um, now, when you switch over to the demand side of the market, you have three buyer pools. Okay. So, and you know, I tell my agents this, it's funny because a couple months ago when we started to adjust what we were saying to our clients and all of that, um, th I was telling them about this, the three buckets, right? And now, now that things have progressed, now I find myself, now I'm telling clients about the three buckets because they want to understand the supply side and they want to understand the demand side as well. And in order to, to explain the demand side, I, there's no, um, uh, graph that I could send them that's going to tell them. Okay. So what I need to do in, in, in order to explain the demand side is I have to tell them what we're seeing. So when we talk to buyers right now, they basically fall in three different buckets, right? You have the people that um, are still transacting right now. Okay. And I would say that's a minority bucket. It's definitely a smaller bucket uh, out of the full pool of buyers. And in that bucket, you, I, I'd say it, people are still transacting, tra 
transacting because of one of two things, right? Either one, you uh, have to out of necessity, right? You're relocating from somewhere else. Your family has to have a, ha a place to live. Uh, maybe you got married and you have a, ki uh, a new baby on the way and you've outgrown your one bedroom place and you got to get, <laughs> get a bigger place. Uh, maybe someone's passed away and they have to sell the property. Maybe there's a divorce. You know, there's certain things that people still have to transact out of necessity. The second uh, group of people that are in that same first bucket that are still transacting, I call it the greed, right? Because if, if say you're an investor and, and usually it's more on the investor side, sometimes you get it on the primary uh, purchase side as well, but it's really driven by, uh, they see an opportunity. They don't think that the market's going to go down. They think that it's going to hold tight or continue to go up. And they think that since inventory is slightly higher uh, and demand is a little bit lower because there's a lot of pent up buyers on the sidelines, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but because of that increase in inventory and decrease in demand, they think they can get a better deal right now. So instead of seeing a dozen offers on properties like we were two months ago, now they're only seeing maybe one or two offers on the good properties. So people that want closing costs, for example, because maybe they're they're uh, out of pocket, they don't have a lot of funds saved up. So they're trying to keep the out of pocket low. So they're using a DPA program, a down payment assistance program, and they need sellers to pay their closing costs. If that's the case, this is perfect time for those people. Two months ago, they were getting outbid on every property they came across because they were going with cash buyers. They were going with people that didn't need closing costs, didn't need a DPA. Now those people have an opportunity to go lock up a deal while the demand is a little softer and the inventory is a little higher. Go lock up those deals. So, um, those are the two types of people that we see in bucket number one that are still transacting right now. Then we have the middle bucket. The middle bucket, I would say, is the majority of people right now. The majority of people can still transact, but they are choosing not to. They are on the sidelines, and we call this pent-up demand. It's people that would normally be buying right now because they want to buy and are able to buy, but they're on the sidelines because of the uncertainty of the virus or for safety concerns. They don't want to go out. They don't want to do showings. or It's one of the two. Um, and I would say this middle bucket, when all the virus first happened, majority of people were in this bucket and they were on the sidelines firm. I'm not doing anything. I'm waiting and I'm going to see how it all plays out. Um, but I would say now, uh, it is, I don't know if it's just a, qu uh, a question of people getting bored sitting at home or maybe they're starting to see a little uh, light at the end of the tunnel because the thing's starting to reopen. They think it's not as bad as they originally thought it was going to be, this type of thing. Um, but we'd say I'd say about 20 to 30 percent of the people that were on the sidelines are starting to jump back in and now transact. Um, you know, but I would say the majority of them, a good, you know, 70, 80 percent of the pent up demand is still pent up and sitting on the sidelines. Due to that, I think as soon as that confidence comes back and all those people jump back in the market, that in, that uptick and increase in inventory that we saw, I think is either really going to flatten out or it's going to go back down because now all these people that have been waiting months to buy just jumped back in and bought. Um, so that, that's the middle bucket. And I would say that's the majority of people. And then you have the third bucket. The third bucket of people are the people that cannot transact, even if they wanted to right now, they either lost their job. They had to shut down their business. They had a decrease in income with their debt to income ratio. They can't qualify anymore. Um, maybe the lending guidelines tightened up a little bit and they need a higher credit score than they did before. And they, uh, can, can no longer qualify. Um, or maybe they're sick. Maybe they got the virus. Maybe their family member got their virus. Maybe they, you know, they had to relocate to somewhere else, you know? So, and I would say this is a minority bucket also in, in regards to our buyer pool anyway, the one, the people that we're talking to, um, bucket number one and bucket number two, three are the two minority buckets. And the majority is in that middle one, uh, in the pent up demand. So the reason I bring this up is because I want people to understand that, you know, uh, inventory has not shot up and now we're in a buyer's market. We are still not in a buyer's market. So anybody who's telling you that we are, and it's doom and gloom and the, and the sky is falling and, you know, you should panic, sell your home to them and give them all your equity. Um, you know, please consult an agent. You know, we'd be happy to help you. Um, if you have another agent that you trust, reach out to them and have them run the numbers and run the comps for you and tell you what you could get if you sold traditionally uh, versus what some of these investors or even the I buyers. You know, so it, let's talk about the iBuyers for a second. You have Open Door, OfferPad, Zillow, uh, you know, a whole a whole list of them. I, I believe there's about 17 um, 
I buyers, investor buyer, whatever you want to call them that are going to come in and basically lowball you and you're paying for convenience. You know, it's like trading in your car. You want to uh, take a loss and give up some of your equity to not have to show it, close when you want to, cash buyer, all that good stuff. Um, so uh, with I buyers jumping back into the market, some of them are already buying again here in Las Vegas. Some of them are not. They're opening in other parts of the country and then they're going to trickle down and eventually come back here as well. But I'll tell you right now, their margins were, were thin before. And now with uh, the risk of possibly going into a declining market, again, I don't know if that's going to happen. Neither do they. But to manage their risk, they are going to offer um, lower offers or higher service fees than they did before. Meaning the net proceeds to the seller is going to be less now than what they were doing two, three months ago. So if you're, if you're interested in going with one of those iBuyers, um, what I would recommend doing is contact your agent, Feel free to reach out to us if you'd like. And what we'll do is we will still represent you and go that route if you'd like. Um, and what we can do is we can we can write up a comparison. This is a settlement statement with the net proceeds uh, to you, the seller, if you were to sell traditionally with us. This is if you go with Zillow. This is if you go with OfferPad. This is if you go with open door or you know all the way down the, the line and then we can go out there and we can see all the cash offers that we could get for you we'll compare all the bottom lines and you always want to compare net proceeds to seller on each one of these offers never look at just the offer price because they a lot of times they put service fees and knickknack charges in there to confuse the consumer so that they think that hey well look the offer price is only 10,000 difference well yes the offer price is only 10,000 different but if you drop the uh uh, if, if you drop all the way down to the bottom line and see after all the fees, then actually it's forty thousand dollars different. You know, hey, maybe two three months ago when you know everybody was doing great and you know uh, people weren't counting every penny, they would be more likely to take a forty thousand dollar loss so that I didn't have to do showings. I can move out next week or whatever the case may be. But now when people are going through harder times, I think they're going to be a lot more conscious of their equity and maximizing that net proceeds to sellers. So it's really important to find out what those net proceeds will be so that you can uh, not shortchange yourself and leave a ton of money on the table. So uh, just uh, make an educated decision is all I'm saying. If you still choose to give up the money and go with uh, uh, convenience, no problem whatsoever. I would still recommend having an agent on your side so that they could represent you through the sale because the agent uh, that's giving you the offer for those iBuyers works for those iBuyers. So that's the same as the buyer representing you. And their job is to get the best deal for for the buyer, not for you. So have an agent that's going to represent you. And even if you're going through that same process where it's all about convenience and doing it fast and you're giving up some equity, um, you know, let us or a, a trusted agent uh, guide you through that process. So uh, that's all I got for today. Um, I'm going to do another one on the uh, independent uh, contractor unemployment that uh, just opened up recently. And uh, of course, we'd be happy to answer any questions and uh, help you and your family through this time. So please give me a call at any time, 702-349-9175. Uh, uh, I hope you all say, uh, stay uh, safe and healthy out there. And uh, please consider us a resource. Take care.